Good afternoon, and welcome to the 2011 Bonnie Cashin Lecture here in UCLA Library Special Collections. I'm really excited about today. Uh, I am Tom Hyrie. I'm the director of Library Special Collections here. And since at least some of you have likely never been here before, I'd just like to say that Special Collections is dedicated to collecting, preserving, and making accessible for research specialized holdings in the UCLA library that include manuscripts, rare books, photographs, and archival collections. The collections support a wide variety of disciplines in the arts, humanities, social sciences, and even sciences, and we are dedicated to ensuring that our collections are put to good use through research and scholarship and such programs as we will be enjoying this afternoon. This is a great day for us. One we've been looking forward to for many months is we celebrate not one, but two events. The opening of our current exhibition, John Fonte, A Life in the Works. So and I hope you will all take it in uh, during the reception afterwards. And the Bonnie Cashin Lecture, which not coincidentally features Fonte's biographer, Stephen Cooper. But before we get to the lecture, we must remember Bonnie Cashin, whose legacy makes this event possible, and whose life we celebrate today with this lecture series. Fashion designer Bonnie Cashin was a pioneer of 20th century American sportswear and one of the most innovative American designers of her time. She was a California girl, born in Fresno in 1908. She grew up in a string of California cities and as a high school student began a career in costume design for the theater that took her to New York in 1933. She designed costumes for chorus girls, uniforms for World War II, and wardrobes for over 60 Hollywood movies before moving to 7th Avenue. Her legendary designs for Adler and Adler, Sills and Company, and Coach established her as one of the most innovative American designers of the second half of the 20th century. A five-time Cody Award winner, Cashin entered their Hall of Fame in 1972. Cashin's credo, chic is where you find it, expressed her belief that a designer's most important tools were a habit of wonder and an ability to connect the fashion world with objects and ideas not usually associated with it. She took inspiration from the rhythm of poetry or good reading, citing John Gardner, Henry Thoreau, George Sepharis, Buckminster Fuller, and Bertrand Russell as influences who helped to stretch her mind and give inspiration for her ready-to-wear designs. After Cashin's death in 2000, her executors, Curtis Keller and Henry Grady, were charged with the responsibility of stewarding Cashin's estate with the goal of furthering her legacy to the creative process. We'll always be proud of their choice of the UCLA Library as a place where the work of Bonnie's life could be best preserved and promoted. They donated her archive, the Bonnie Cashin Collection of Fashion, Theater, and Film Costume Design, to UCLA Library Special Collections, where it is now available for use by researchers from all disciplines. At the same time, they established an endowment to support the Bonnie Cashin Lecture Series, bringing gifted individuals from very creative pursuits to UCLA Library to celebrate the creative process and to preserve the legacy of Cashin's remarkable life and work. So I'd like to just recognize Bonnie. Bonnie. <laughs> so before moving on to the lecture, I'd like to recognize a few special guests. First of all, we have with us today Gary Strong, our university librarian, and a great supporter of the collections and programs of Library Special Collections. Gary <laughs> Next, we're just thrilled to have with us many members of the Fonte family. I would especially like to introduce the children of John Fonte who are with us today, Victoria Fonte Cohen and Jim Fonte. Together with their brother Dan, Vicki and Jim have been instrumental partners with us in ensuring that the Fonte papers found a home at UCLA where they have been preserved and are now available to researchers studying Fonte, his contemporaries, and the many important social and cultural movements in which he played such a vital role. So I have one more special guest to recognize, and this is really cool, I just learned. Um, we're so pleased to be joined by Stephen Cooper's father-in-law, Stan Stawiski, who's a user <laughs> I'm really sorry, but, but the reason I'm excited, so we house the university archives here, 
And Stan is a member of the UCLA class of 1936, <laughs> and will therefore be celebrating his 75th reunion in just a few months. So, uh, yeah, that's just <laughs> take this opportunity to acknowledge the wonderful staff of the library special collections and the library uh, in general, so many of whom have worked together to organize this event today. And in particular, I have to single out Cindy Newsom, whose efforts have really made this event happen. So um, Cindy's probably in the back somewhere too. Yeah, anyway, so thank you. <laughs> So uh, now I'd like to introduce Jeannie Garrard, our manuscripts curator, who uh, will tell a little bit of the story of how the uh, John Fonte archive came to UCLA. Thank you, Tom. Well, I'd like to start by saying it is truly an honor to be for us in the UCLA Library Special Collections to have become the stewards of the archive of the quintessential LA writer, John Fonte. And for me and several of my colleagues in Special Collections to have had the additional honor of working closely with Vicki Fonte Cohen and Stephen Cooper, who have shared with us so many stories and insights about Fonte as a father and as a writer some of his dreams, challenges, humor, and his style. And over the past two years, we've had the pleasure of meeting all of the Fonte children and their families, and we feel that our association has really grown into a partnership for which we are very grateful. As Tom mentioned, our collections are extraordinarily rich and diverse. We do have a proud tradition of collecting literary papers, and the Fonte Papers is the most important new literary archive we've acquired in years. John Fonte's archive now joins writers of similar genre and kindred spirit here at UCLA, like Raymond Chandler, Jim Thompson, Jim Tully, Horace McCoy, Dalton Trumbo, Preston Sturgis, also uh, Fonte's dear friend for 30 years, Carrie McWilliams. We also hold preeminent collections of writers of Susan Sontag, Aldous Huxley, Henry Miller, Anais Nan, and many more. Well, Tom said that I would tell the story of the papers coming to UCLA, and that story is one that begins with Stephen Cooper reaching out to Joyce Fonte in 1994 when he wrote to her to ask permission to write Fonte's biography. It was Stephen who, um, having had exclusive access to the archives at the Fonte home for years, first recognized that these papers needed a proper home so they would be made available to future researchers. He sought the advice of his then mentor and dissertation chair in the English department at USC, Ron Gottesman, who recommended going to Vicki Steele, then head of special collections at USC and then subsequently at UCLA because Gottesman said she would do the right thing. So Steve wrote to Vicki, they stayed in touch for several years, and in 2002, a friend of Steve's threw a party inviting Joyce, the Fonte children, Steve and Vicki. Introductions were made, interest was expressed, and UCLA was then in the running. Well then in 2006, sadly Joyce Fonte passed away, and the papers were moved to a storage facility in Agora Hills. And though the facility was um, state of the art, Vicki Fonte and her brothers grew increasingly concerned about the fragility and vulnerability of the archives, and they wanted it to be preserved and wanted it to be properly organized and arranged and made accessible. Guess what? That's what we do. <laughs> so, perfect. Later that year, um, Vicki Fonte invited Steve and Vicki Steele out to Malibu to see some of the items in the collection and discussions ensued, and then in 2009, the papers were placed here at UCLA in Special Collections. And that was when I was introduced to Vicki Fonte Cohen, uh, to primarily to make plans for bringing the collection to UCLA, and subsequently spent a magical day in the Agora storage vault, <laughs> packing up the collection <laughs> with my colleagues, Lila Satayama and Simon Elliott. Are you guys here? Simon and Lila. Um, uh, and my daughter, Emma. And um, on this day, we were joined by Vicki, her husband, Mickey, uh, and Jim's wife, Jennifer, who's also here today. 
So we rolled up our sleeves, carefully marking and packing uh, the entire archive, most of which um, Steve had gone through over that five-year period. But we were privileged to be able to say things like, you know, hey, Vicki, what's this? Are these John's annotations, or are those the publisher's annotations? And wow, there's this high school diary, and here's like a bundle of letters from John Fonte to his mother. And my daughter Emma pulled up, wow, a Bukowski um, record album inscribed to John Fonte, which you can see in this exhibit here today. And Vicki said, well, you know, you should definitely see the letter from Senator Kennedy to my father. So the day went on and on like that. And on that day, we knew that there was a real partnership between the Fonte family and UCLA to promote the scholarship of the works of John Fonte. Well, now I'd like to tell you about a wonderful series of events and synapses and enthusiasm that ensued as soon as the papers were transferred to UCLA, which was in March of 2009, just about a month before the 100th birthday of John Fonte. We invited Rafael Perez Torres, uh, professor and then chair of the English department of UCLA, to uh, view some of the items in the collection. And um, understanding that this archive would provide a unique opportunity for a graduate student, uh, and in the interest of wasting no time at all to uh, begin processing the collection, we asked Rafael if he might know of a graduate student who might be interested in processing the papers in our Center for Primary Research and Training. Um, this is a, in this center, UCLA graduate students are trained in archival methods of processing and description. We match unprocessed collections with their research interests, and their work then results in a rich scholarly experience for them and further access to collections for other researchers. Well, within one day of this meeting, it happened that Daniel Gardner, Daniel, was a PhD candidate in the English department, met with Raphael to discuss his dissertation topic, Italian-American literature in the 1930s. Raphael told, <laughs> yeah. told Daniel about the opportunity in the CFPRT. He emailed us, applied to the center, and began to process the collection in the summer of 2009 under the excellent direction of CFPRT coordinator Kelly Bockley. Already thinking about the possibility of Stephen Cooper and his biography of Fonte as a passion lecture, we asked Daniel if he would like to um, extend his work in the center by curating an exhibit from the archive that would complement the lecture. And again, he readily accepted the challenge. We like it that um, a layer to his experience in the center, which was to be thinking about creating an exhibit from the archive as it was being processed and described, and to work closely with the biographer of the creator of this archive throughout the process, as well as his daughter. Um, was a very rich experience. Together, Stephen and Daniel shaped the story that is told in the exhibit that surrounds you. And I think you'll agree that Daniel's choices of items to be included in the exhibit are really key to our gaining a new perspective and understanding about John Fonte. So thank you, Daniel, for creating such a thoughtful work. And it's one that will benefit visitors to UCLA through June and really in perpetuity, or for as long as there's an internet, because um, it, after the exhibit comes down, it will be available online from our website. So Daniel, can you please see that? I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank Octavio Overa, visual arts specialist. Where are you, Octavio? Um, Octavio designed and mounted this exhibit. Octavio not only knows how to bring visual appeal to our exhibits and works tirelessly to do so, but as one who knows and works closely with our collections on preservation and access, he truly becomes a collaborator with our exhibition developers. Thank you, Octavio.